You know, it used to be easy to recognize a Christian missionary to the Jews. We could recognize the Christian missionary by his bloody sword, a sword of Christian love that offered us an easy, relatively unambiguous choice, baptism or death. Times changed, swords fell out of fashion, but the missionary remained recognizable nonetheless. The missionary wore a cross. The missionary told us of his or her belief that Jesus Christ was God. The missionary invited us to his church. Today's missionary to the Jews, as many of you know, is not like that. Today's missionary to the Jews has traded their cross for a Jewish star. Today's missionary to the Jews typically has a name like Baruch or Shoshana, even if their name was Mary or Patrick at birth. A good example, Lloyd Carson, a missionary with the Jews for Jesus organization. If you call him, hey Lloyd, he won't answer. His new name, Tuvia Zaretsky. <laughs> Today's missionary to the Jews tells us how much they love Israel and the Jewish people while munching on a bagel or dancing the Hora. I spoke not too long ago at the University of Pennsylvania. There in the audience was a gentleman named Fred Klett, a professional missionary to the Jews with an office on campus who has only one goal, to convert Jewish college students to Christianity. And Fred asked me a lot of questions during the question and answer, and I decided I would turn the tables. I said, Fred, let me ask you a question or two. I said, I see you have in your hands a New Testament. Do you believe in that Bible? And he said, sure I do. It's the Word of God. And I said, Fred, tell me, based upon your understanding of that book, would you agree that the six million Jews in the Holocaust went straight from the fires of Auschwitz to the fires of hell? Fred is a bit too honest to be a missionary. And he answered honestly. I think as a result, he hasn't really converted anyone. And he said, that's what my Bible teaches. And that's what I believe. The question could be asked, how is it possible for anyone to get involved in so life-denying, so inhuman, so hateful, so non-Jewish a system? I'm going to try and answer that from my own story, a story of someone who spent several years in the Hebrew Christian missionary movement. Were it only my story, it would be of little significance, an evening's entertainment, a quaint oddity, the fact is, Hebrew Christianity, or as it calls itself, Messianic Judaism, or generically the Jews for Jesus movement, has attracted an estimated 100,000 Jews, 100,000 Jews in the various born-again Christian movements that specifically target Jews for conversion. Hebrew Christianity has attracted some of the most vital, most spiritual, sometimes most intellectual, among our people. In a sense, my own story is the story of a generation, a generation that's lost touch with its Jewish roots, its Jewish soul, a generation that's lost touch with the very core of its Jewish identity. It's also the story of a multi-million dollar Christian missionary movement that has at its helm names familiar to many of us, names like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swaggart. In my own case, I grew up in suburban New York, went to a public school, an afternoon Hebrew school, three days a week. This is the prelude to a lavish bar mitzvah that had a lot of bar, and I think the concept of mitzvah wasn't very well known to me. <laughs> the, uh, the, cantor of, the cantor of my synagogue, by the way, was later baptized with me, and he's now a Jew for Jesus cantor in Northern Virginia. The, Washington Jewish Week, writing about one of my talks, described my speaking style as that of a shy bar mitzvah boy who nervously fingers the microphone. And it made me think, what was this bar mitzvah picture of Judaism that I would later bring into adolescence and into adult life? And I can come up with about four things. A childish mixture of some Bible stories that no one really believed some quaint ethnic foods, gefilte fish and chopped liver, a suggestion from my parents later on that I should try and stick to Jewish girls, and an attachment to the state of Israel a little bit greater than my Italian friends. In a way I could barely perceive, something inside of me was crying out for meaning, 
for purpose, for value. And this Judaism seemed no more relevant to that than some museum piece that we took out on special occasions. At a Shabbaton recently, a girl told a rabbi there a story. She said, Rabbi, I feel really proud to be Jewish. And this was a girl, nothing Jewish about her life, no Jewish friends, no Jewish involvements. She was engaged to a non-Jewish fellow. But the rabbi answered, he said, it's really good that you feel proud to be Jewish because you really look very Jewish. <laughs> and she walked out angrily. <laughs> to many of us, that's what our Jewish identity is, a vague feeling, some sort of emotion, but without a whole lot of content. In my teen years, later in adolescence, I remember relatives would say to me, to be your age again, it's the best time of your life. I wish I could be your age again. And I remember thinking, if this is the best time in my life, <laughs> you know, I want to end it here. <laughs> it couldn't get much worse. I had a lot of friends, but still I felt lonely. A lot of Jewish traditions, but somehow lost and empty inside. I was precisely the type of person that these groups target. Anyone who's feeling hurt, lonely, searching, in transition, is vulnerable. All of us experience that at one time or another. That's when these groups are on the lookout, and that's when these groups take aim. Speaking to a Hadassah group in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, a woman came up to me and related a story. Her husband was in the hospital, dying of a critical leukemia. Just then, the local Hebrew Christian missionary group, they call themselves the Friends of Israel there, decided to take aim for her 14-year-old son, visiting him, speaking to him at the hospital while he was there to visit his father. Always with two messages. One, if you ask Jesus into your heart, your father will live. The second message, don't tell your mother, she won't understand. Went to Brandeis University, Antioch Law School, and I was working for the District of Columbia office of a large, now defunct, Los Angeles law firm, Cattison, Felser, Woodard, Quinn, and Rossi. In late 1980, some Christian clients began sharing with me the essence of their faith, using strategies and tactics specifically designed to bring Jews into fundamentalist Christianity. The, Morris Cirillo, a Hebrew Christian evangelist based here in California, said, I'd rather convert one Jew than 50,000 Gentiles. As a result, these groups spend an estimated $100,000 for each Jew that they convert. So they have the techniques down fairly well. The first technique, what if I said, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and I can prove it to you from the New Testament. Not a very effective technique among Jewish people. And the missionaries, of course, know this. So instead, what they told me was that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, and they could prove it to me from the Old Testament, from our Bible. The missionaries since then have gotten somewhat more sophisticated, and sometimes they'll say, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I can prove it to you from the Tanakh. Many missionaries have a problem, for some reason, with the ch sound. <laughs> and you may hear, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I can prove it to you from the Tanach. <laughs> uh, the Dubner Magi tells a story about a man who goes into the woods for some target practice with a bow and arrow. And as he enters the woods, he sees a tree on the middle of the tree, a target, and smack in the middle of the target, an arrow, a bullseye. He walks along in the woods another 10 feet, and the same thing, another tree, another target, another bullseye, and so on throughout the forest. And he said, I have to find the man that preceded me here. How could anyone be such a good shot? A bullseye every time. He made some inquiries, finally found the man and said, Master, teach me. How did you get to be so good? The man said, really, there's no secret. What I do is, first I shoot the arrow, then I draw the target. <laughs> this is precisely the way the missionaries operate when they come to our Jewish Bible. They have their theology, Christian theology, 
Protestant Christian theology with Jesus at its center, and then they come to our Bible and they snip out a little mistranslated phrase here, a little out of context sentence there, in an attempt to prove their point. The proofs in each and every case are distorted, taken out of context, sometimes fabricated outright. But this, with my limited biblical knowledge, I didn't know. Very few of us are trained to think critically, precisely the opposite. At some point in time, we learn to turn off our power of critical thinking in the areas most important to us. I saw this here in an area perhaps not the most important to me, but uh, my toothpaste, some of you may have seen checkup, adult toothpaste here. And the first claim made on this checkup toothpaste, it says checkup actually helps remove plaque wherever you brush. So I was thinking, sounds like a good toothpaste, <laughs> until I began thinking about that, wherever you brush. Does it mean it will remove it as effectively in my basement as in my kitchen? <laughs> or does it mean it's as effective on the plaque on my toes as it is on the plaque on my elbow? I don't know. We, we learn not to think critically, and the missionaries take advantage of that. The second technique. What if I said, give up being Jewish and join my religion, fundamentalist Christianity? Not a very attractive offer to even the most assimilated Jew. So the missionaries don't say that. They told me that I wasn't giving up being Jewish. I'd be a better Jew, a completed Jew, a fulfilled Jew. I could be a Jew and a Christian at the same time. This is a technique designed to ease the guilt that virtually every Jew feels when they adopt the Christian faith, when they convert to Christianity. I remember when I first got involved, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but I flew back from here in LA to New York, and I said to my mother, Mom, I found the Lord. And she was less than delighted. <laughs> uh, had I said I was a Buddhist or an atheist, it wouldn't have been as bad, but the one thing a nice Jewish boy doesn't become is a Christian. So this technique is to ease the guilt that so many of us feel upon a conversion to Christianity. An analogy to this technique was suggested to me. Imagine for a minute that I'm a Republican politician in a Democratic neighborhood. If I were to use this technique, I might say something like, I'm not asking you to be a Republican. Your father was a Democrat. Your grandfather was a Democrat. Stay being a Democrat. All that I'm asking is, every time you go in that voting booth, close your eyes and pull the Republican lever. This is precisely what the missionaries are saying. They're asking us to give up every belief that has defined Jewish identity for 3,500 years to accept the Christian position and reject the Jewish one every single time they disagree. And then they end up, generally with a phony Yiddish accent, saying something like, but it's okay, you're still Jewish. It's a beautiful tradition. The third technique, and really the most effective, what if I said, join my religion and feel guilty all the time? Join my religion and be constantly afraid of the devil. And by the way, the devil is very, very real to these people. Have people seen the movie? I'm sure most of you have seen the movie The Exorcist. We used to have in our group exorcisms fairly frequently. We didn't call them exorcisms. Exorcism is a Catholic word. We called them deliverance. We were delivering the soul from the power of the devil. And I remember the first time I saw a deliverance, an exorcism, there was a 17-year-old girl, obviously very troubled, sitting in the middle of our circle, perspiring, crying. And one of the leaders of our group said, Larry, would you lead the deliverance? So I'd never even seen an exorcism before. Wasn't sure quite what to do, but I had seen the movie, fortunately, The Exorcist. <laughs> and I remember I tried to look real spiritual, 
thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Meanwhile, in my mind was, what did the priest say in that movie? <laughs> and I remembered, the priest said, demon, what is thy name? So I said it, speaking in King James English, of course. And I think this young girl had also seen the movie because she answered right out of the movie, my name is Legion. <laughs> But again, what if I said, join my religion, feel guilty, be afraid of the devil all the time? We're not going to let you think for yourself anymore. We'll do all your thinking for you. Not a very effective technique. So the missionaries don't say that. Instead, they told me, and they always use the same four words, I could have a personal relationship with God. The idea is to find a weakness, a need, a vulnerability. It might be sexual problems. It might be compulsions, drugs, gambling. It might be loneliness. It might be a poor self-image. And to hold out the hope that any of those problems will be resolved by going in, into their system. I was at a congregation in Baltimore visiting not too long ago called Rosh Pina Congregation, one of these Hebrew Christian groups. And the phony nature, the shell game nature of this promise became so apparent to me. There was a speaker, a fellow named Michael Brown, a leader of the so-called Jews for Jesus movement, and when he saw me there, he directed his whole spiel to me. And he said, the anti-missionaries say, where are the miracles? And then he laughed, and he said, each one of us has experienced thousands of miracles. And everyone was saying, amen, amen. <laughs> he then asked, if anyone needs to receive healing, could they please come up to the front? Every seat was vacated. Everyone ran up to the front. And it became clear to me, we had here a room full of people who had all been led to believe that everyone else in that room was experiencing miracles and who had internalized the feeling Everyone else is getting it. Maybe someday I'll get those miracles too. A room full of people that were lost, that were hurting, that were in pain, all of whom had been fooled into thinking that they were the only ones. It's a game that ultimately doesn't work. But to those unaware of the spiritual possibilities within our own faith, of the fact that we're the people that gave the world the notion of a personal relationship with a God who cares, this Christian offer, a personal relationship with God, does seem very, very attractive. I was out here in Los Angeles in January of 1981 for a several month stay to coordinate projects between our law firms, Los Angeles and DC offices. And fairly shortly after I got here, I had a born again experience. Are people aware of the concept of born again? We hear about born again Christianity. What does it mean? Those of you who, like myself, are into movies, you may have seen the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> this is the fundamentalist concept of being born again. And they base it on certain verses in the New Testament where they actually believe that they've died and that the spirit of Jesus now resides in them, guiding their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions. I contacted, here in Los Angeles, the Jews for Jesus organization, one of approximately 150, perhaps there are more, organizations that are specifically designed to convert Jews to fundamentalist Christianity. Jews for Jesus is probably the best known because they tend to be the most obnoxious. Within two weeks, they had me at the Los Angeles airport on a Friday night distributing pamphlets with catchy titles like Christmas is a Jewish holiday. <laughs> to my dismay, one of the passengers at the airport that night was a partner, a Jewish partner at our law firm, who, like my mother, was less than pleased with my activities. <laughs> and uh, he made sure that his dissatisfaction was duly recorded on my annual evaluation. 
Actually, my evaluation was good that year. The only two negatives were my Los Angeles airport activities and my then unfortunate tendency to dress in polyester leisure suits. <laughs> At the end of my stay in Los Angeles, I was only here about three and a half or four months, Reverend Martin Rosen, the head of Jews for Jesus, he calls himself Moish Rosen, he referred me to a Hebrew Christian congregation outside of Washington, D.C., in Rockville, Maryland. And it was on my return to the East Coast that I really began to get involved in the heart of the missionary movement to the Jews, the so-called Messianic Jewish movement. I joined a congregation called Beth Messiah, one of a number of Christian churches, many of which are funded by Gentile denominations, which call themselves Messianic Jewish synagogues. Has anyone here ever been to a Messianic Jewish synagogue? Just a show of hands. I see not too many. <laughs> So I'll describe generally what our congregation was like, what most of these congregations are like. There's generally a Christian minister who leads them, but who calls himself rabbi. In our case, it was Rabbi Dan Juster. The men wear yarmulkes. They wear talesim. We had a Torah scroll in front. Almost never could anybody read it, but it stood up there like a gigantic symbol. The singing had a Jewish flavor and a Hasidic beat. And we used a lot of Hebrew language. We were carefully trained in this. We didn't call him Jesus. We were trained to call him Yeshua. Jesus' mother, Mary. Mary doesn't sound Jewish to a lot of people. So we were told, don't say Mary. Call her Miriam. As we led people to baptism, it was explained, this isn't really baptism. This is the Jewish concept of mikvah, where we mikvah people, <laughs> where we then mikvah people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh. <laughs> Beneath this facade, the same Gentile Christianity offered to us for 2,000 years at the point of a sword. It's now been fitted up with a yarmulke, spiced with a little Hebrew, a little Yiddish. Jerry Falwell with payas is what we're dealing with. <laughs> a couple of attractive aspects. One is the friendliness. I can go to virtually any temple, any synagogue, stay for the service, perhaps afterward go to the Kiddush, go to the Oneg. If so much as one person comes up to me, it'll be probably to say something like, excuse me, could you please move? You're sitting in my seat. <laughs> that would never happen in these groups. They're carefully trained to look for newcomers to make people feel welcome. And what they're onto is this. We all want to feel wanted to feel needed, to have someone reach out and acknowledge our dignity as a human being. If we don't give people that, we can rest assured they won't be back, and these groups will find them. A second positive aspect, there's a faith, a passion, that sometimes seems foreign to us in our religious life, in our worship. The I remember somebody's automobile transmission broke in our group. It can sometimes go to extremes. And we had a dispute in the group. Should we be praying for the hand of God to come down directly and fix the car? Or should we be praying for a good price at the repair shop? I remember I wanted to see that hand. <laughs> but I lost on that vote. As absurd as it sounds, as absurd as it is, there's something real there, a real belief, a real faith, a very Jewish faith that God is real and that God is willing and able to make a difference in our lives. After three weeks in the group, Dan Juster, the head of our group, Rabbi Dan, came to me with a prophecy. He said God had given him the night before. By the way, it's very easy to be a prophet in these groups. Just raise your hands look spiritual, say something stupid, and then follow it with, thus saith the Lord. Another Jeremiah. The, 
I remember nobody took the prophecies that seriously. The Bible says if somebody gives up a false prophecy, you're supposed to stone them. In our group, I remember one of the leaders, Keith Intrader, went to a, a girl in our group named Lisa one day and said, Lisa, the Lord told me yesterday that you're supposed to be my wife. <laughs> Lisa was a little taken aback. She said, well, I don't know, Keith, I think I'll wait and see if I hear the same word from the Lord. <laughs> uh, six months later, Keith married somebody else, and it was forgotten. We sort of got used to these rounds of false prophecy. But Dan came to me with a prophecy, and he told me that I was to be involved in, God had told him I was to be involved in, later to take charge of campus ministry, converting Jewish college students on the Washington area college campuses. This was my first taste of the type of spiritual manipulation that's rampant in these groups, manipulation of people by claims to divine revelation. At the time, there was a tremendous ego satisfaction to think that God was speaking to our leader about little old me, only three weeks in the group. I was trained in the techniques to convert college students and ultimately set up tables weekly on college campuses in the Washington and suburban Washington area. Week after week, lines of college students, Jewish college students, waiting to see us, to talk to us, to take our literature. College students not looking to be Christian, desperately seeking something authentic, something real, something Jewish. And with our Jewish stars, our Israeli flag, our Jewish music. We were there on the campuses claiming to provide it. The time came that I had certain doubts about this movement, a movement which had become the focus of my life, a movement into which I had brought my brother, my sister. And these doubts are rampant within the movement, although there's no encouragement at all to share doubts or ambiguities, instead tremendous pressure to confirm the validity of our beliefs, to appear certain, not to give in to the devil's questions. Do you ever notice when you see a Jew for Jesus, a Hebrew Christian, a cult member, and they're always smiling? And you think, why are they smiling? Is it gas pains? Is it... <laughs> what we have to remember is the missionary is a salesman. The missionary wants you to believe that they found something that's making them so happy, and if you buy it, you'll be happy too. If I wanted to sell you this, this book, and I said, does anyone want to buy this book? You'd probably not be very interested. You know, keep it away from me, and whatever it is, it's not making you very happy. The missionary knows that, and they want you to believe that they found something that makes them very happy. Behind those smiles, a tremendous amount of doubt, a tremendous amount of pain in virtually every Hebrew Christian that I've ever met. In my own case, I began to question the absolutism of the system. We looked at the world always as heaven and hell, us and them, in black and white terms. I was in a system which served to explain everything, but always at a price that would consign 99% of the world, practically everyone I loved, to an eternal hell for not believing like we did, and which cast me in the role of eternal spy, relating to the world always as an outsider, always looking for a weakness or a need into which I might begin the conversionary process with my family, with my friends, with the stranger on the bus. I also noticed a tremendous degree of superficiality in the relationships within the group. As long as we pretended to go along, pretended that everything was okay, that miracles and divine messages and prophecy were a daily occurrence, we were accepted. But there were vast areas of our lives, our hurts, our pains, our frustrations that were taboo, that we weren't allowed to share for risk of losing status within the group. I also noticed we were constantly plagued with a sense of guilt, a sense we were never quite good enough. These groups feed on this guilt 
and they turn it right back on the person in a very potent device for mind control. I remember a girl in our group, a girl named Patty, who had been blind from birth. And every week we'd have these little healing services where we'd ask people to come to the front and we'd generally sprinkle a little Israeli olive oil on their heads that they should be healed. And week after week, Patty would sit down, still blind, still unable to see, and with tears in her eyes. And we had to explain why was it that the Lord wasn't healing Patty. So there were two explanations. One was, Patty just didn't have enough faith. And that was always our unspoken prayer for each of ourselves. Oh Lord, give me more faith. If I believe better, then maybe it'll work. The second was, Patty must have some secret sin in her life. Why the Lord is refusing to heal her. So Patty was now not only blind, but derided as in some sense a secret sinner. Lack of faith, secret sins. The unfortunate part is most of us thought that we were all alone in this. I remember the day after my sister exited our group, she related to me. She stood in front of a mirror, stood naked in front of a mirror, and she said for the first time in a year and a half, she felt clean. She felt like a weight of guilt, of being not good enough had suddenly been lifted from her shoulders. When I decided to investigate whether or not this system was true, the movement hit me with both guns. First with the theological pressures. I was opening Satan's door, treading dangerously close to an eternity in hell. And we were also taught that there's no relationship with God outside of this theological system. So there are the theological pressures that keep people from being willing to examine the issues with an open mind. And second, more personal pressures. The constant round of calls and visits and warnings designed to dissuade someone from even looking into the system. I remember I shared some of my doubts with a friend who had been a Hebrew Christian for many, many years. And he told me that several years back, he had had many of the same doubts. And he said what he did, he, he prayed to God, God, would you remove my doubts? And he said the next morning he woke up, none of the questions bothered him anymore. Still, I began to look closely at the system, all the while smiling every day on the college campuses. And what I found literally shook my world. I found that the proofs of Christianity from our Jewish Bible were in each and every case based upon ignorance, mistranslations, distortions of context, fabrications. I also found that I couldn't be a Christian and a Jew at the same time, at least not if I believed in our Bible. To give one example, our Bible somewhat immodestly speaks about itself. And it says, the law of the Lord is a delight. Those who keep it will be happy will be blessed by God. I turn to the New Testament. It also speaks about our Torah. It calls it a ministry of death in letters engraved on stones, a yoke of slavery, a source of enmity and bitterness between Jews and Gentiles. I want to also stress here, not all Christians, obviously, view our Torah in this way. There are many beautiful Christians who stand with the Jewish people, who share our hopes, our struggles, our aspirations. Those Christians generally do not interpret the New Testament literally. All of the missionary groups I'm talking about do interpret the New Testament literally. I also found a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in that New Testament, again, when it's interpreted literally. I had noticed some anti-Semitism in our group, a girl I was going out with said to me when she saw an Orthodox Jew, she could always see the devil peeking out from between his or her eyes. Some of you may remember the Reverend Bailey Smith. He said, God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jew. He was the head of the Southern Baptists at the time. He later apologized, and then he said it again. 
I remember at the time we couldn't understand what was all the uproar. It was very clear to us that God couldn't hear the prayers of a Jew who hadn't become a Christian. But these sort of anti-Semitic manifestations I thought were sort of peripheral to the movement until I really began to look into what does the New Testament re read literally say about us? From Jesus, who says to the Jews in the book of John, the fourth book of the New Testament, he says, you are of your father the devil. If God was your father, you'd believe in me. Jewish non-belief as proof of our demonic nature. To Paul, the real founder of Christianity, the Apostle Paul, we used to call him Rabbi Saul or Rab Shaul in our group, who says to the Jews in the New Testament, because you've shown yourselves unworthy of eternal life, I'm turning to the Gentiles, and then turns to the Gentiles and talks about the Jews, telling them that the Jews are under a curse, killers of the Lord, not loved by God, but hostile to all men. Still, even with all this, I stayed in for a while. And I want to stress this. The missionaries are operating on some real needs, personal needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, in some sense physical needs. Unless we're willing to address those needs, people are going to stay in these groups no matter how many Bible proofs we can give them. In my own case, it was only when I discovered anew what it means to be a Jew, that it didn't have to be the child's eye view that I once had, or the demonic New Testament picture that I was able to make the journey at. Only when I discovered by experience that Judaism could be a place for meaning in times of doubt, for hope in times of despair, for strength in times of weakness, only then, by witnessing the passion, the devotion, and the love that committed Jews brought to the study of God's holy word, to the study of the Torah. I had seen passionate teachers before, but rarely passionate students. By experiencing the sense that my actions were approved by God, that there could be divine power in my steps as a Jew, in my words, in my fervent prayer as a Jew, only by living within the supernatural peace of a Shabbat, a day in which all the cares of the rest of the week seemed magically, mystically, to be transported somewhere else, and in which even the act of eating, of sleeping, of making love, could be experienced as a song of praise to God and his creation, only then was I able to make the journey out. It's not a message that too many Jews for Jesus have ever heard. It's not a message that too many Jews for Jesus, or any, I would venture to say, have ever experienced. Looking back, I have certain mixed feelings. I left in most ways with a sigh of relief. I could begin to think again. I could feel for the pain of others, apart from the question, where were they going to spend eternity, in heaven or hell? I could experience the pain, but also the joy of making choices. And I could rejoin our people in a role other than that of spy. There are aspects that I miss. The excitement of the manipulated spirituality. Many wonderful friends within the movement who've been told, don't speak to him, you know, he's the serpent. I've been described in missionary publications as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The shelving of ambiguity and doubt. I'm glad to be here now. I want to thank Rabbi Kravitz for inviting me. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take them.